Our Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for the time we have to spend together tonight. Thank you for the Word of God that gives us direction in all these things. And God, I pray that you teach us and help us to be able to teach others, Lord, that uh, we might draw people to Christ. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, first paragraph, a uh, way of introduction. 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 9 says, For the, a great door and effectual is opened unto me, and there are many adversaries. So that's uh, something called a contrast or a dichotomy. That is, there's a good part and a bad part. And this kind of, in many ways, sums up our new life as a Christian. Uh, when we get saved, there's many new opportunities, and there's all kinds of perspectives that we get when we're born again, things that we come to understand, and it's exciting and it's new. But there's also some obstacles and adversaries that we've become aware, aware of that we never really realized before. So it's important to note this because you don't want to start things on a, on a downer like, oh, yeah, there's some good parts, but now i got more enemies. That's not the point. The enemy's always been there. You just didn't realize he was the enemy before you got saved. So paragraph two, it's not as if the obstacles and the adversaries didn't exist before salvation. It's just that many people are unaware of them or cannot properly identify them without Christ. So, you know, for example, we're going to talk, the title of the message or the uh, lesson tonight is over, Overcoming Obstacles, part number one. And a lot of times, for example, there might be conflicts within a family and things, and the thing, well, it's because of this woman that I'm married to. It's because my kids are so bad. But they don't realize it's not just the other person. In fact, it's often very little the other person. There's other factors involved uh, that, that contribute to that, but you can't properly identify that when you're unsafe. You have no context for that without <clears throat> teaching from the Bible. Mm -hmm. So now that we have Christ's spirit living within us, we have spiritual discernment. That means, that is spiritual discernment means, that we are able to identify things that were always present, but we were essentially blind to them before. So some of the things that, that we can understand when we begin to understand the Bible and learn the Bible is that, oh, that makes sense. That's why that's happening. This is what's going on. And before, it was just like, this is really awkward. This is very aggravating and frustrating, and I don't know why, but I'm mad about it, and I don't like this. And, you know, that's why people get divorces. That's why kids run away from home. That's why there's fighting and, and all that sort of, sort of thing that goes on. Of course, there's never any arguing in Christian families. Because we're perfect. Even Joanna, she argues with herself from time to time. <laughs> or TJ. So you understand what I'm saying there? Uh, the, the idea is that when you get saved, there's new opportunities, but there's new obstacles as well. The obstacles were always there. The adversaries were always there. We just didn't really know what they were, how to recognize them before. So last uh, sentence of the second paragraph, we also have the Bible to guide us. Understanding that God's words are true, we now have an instruction manual for life. And that's a a phrase you want to probably learn and use with other people, especially with a new or a younger Christian, that this Bible is our instruction manual for life. And, and it's just a concept that we get. You get to buy a new barbecue, you get an instruction manual, you buy a, a new game, you get you know some, some how to set the thing up and how to use it and, and that sort of thing, right? So it, this is our instruction manual for life that will help us to deal with things properly. Paragraph 3, the opposition we face in life basically comes in two forms. External, that's things that influence our lives involving other persons and circumstances. In other words, it's not directly to do with us, but it's other things around us that influence us. And the other is internal, that's struggles that come from within our own mind, heart, and personality. And it's an important distinction because uh, oftentimes when we have uh, troubles in life, there's both ex external and internal things that are happening there. But it, you can't sort things out if you can't make the distinction between, you know what, the problem with this part of it is me. Mm -hmm. It's the way I'm thinking, you know, like, I haven't been taking care of myself, I haven't been sleeping at night, I'm overtired, no wonder I'm overreacting, okay? So that's one component. The other thing is other people that, you know, so you hear a lot of people saying, now we need to get rid of the negativity in our life and get rid of the negative people. Well, sometimes people can be a very negative influence on you. And so sometimes you might have to distance yourself from them. All right, so you have external, you have internal. The Apostle Paul, middle of the paragraph, expressed that in 2 Corinthians 7, verse 5. For when we were come into Macedonia, 
Our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, within were fears. So these principles that I've given, these lessons, they're not just kind of out of some psychology book or something like that, some self-help book. They're out of this book. And uh, they have principles from the Bible. So we have things that influence us from without and within. Every struggle we have comes from some combination of those two sources. It's helpful to properly understand where our troubles are coming from so that we can sort out things out effectively. Now let me say this. A lot of times, here's one of the devil's main tools. One of the main tools of the devil is to, first of all, get us distracted. If you can't get us distracted, he wants to get us discouraged. So how does he get us discouraged? Well, oftentimes it's not like some great big thing. And I always like to use the illustration of the old, uh, you know, the old cartoons and, and picture shows used to show the devil like in a little red suit with horns and a pitchfork and a tail. Like you could spot him a mile off. Even a little kid, oh, there's a devil. But he, the Bible says he appears as an angel of light. He's a deceiver. He's a fake. He's a counterfeit. And so what happens is a lot of times, uh, as, as Christians, when we start to get under attack, if you will, spiritually, and we'll deal with that more in, in a minute, but what happens is it, it's a little bit here and a little bit there and a little bit, and it just becomes, it, it becomes so cloudy. Like, you know, if you, as a, as a strong young man, amen? Luke is a strong young man. As a strong young man, I mean, if you were to be attacked by a seven-year-old, you could probably take him. If you were attacked by 27-year-olds all at once, it might be, you know, a little bit more of a challenge. If you were attacked by a hundred of them who were trained, working in unison and coordination, they might take you down, like, just by sheer, you understand what I'm saying? So what happens is, you have external things, you have internal things, you have it coming from here, you have it coming from there, and things just get foggy and cloudy, and it's like you're just swatting at mosquitoes. And that's one of the main tools of the devil, is just to try to get us overwhelmed. And so one of the important things to do is to get along with God and, and ask for his help and discernment to begin to sort those things out. And to say, okay, well this part I need to address this way, this part I need to address this way, I need to repair that relationship with that person, I need to take care of that this way, and we begin to sort things out, then we can actually resolve things. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. uh, an important part to sorting things out effectively is knowing where they're coming from. All right, paragraph four. In this lesson, we'll talk about some typical obstacles that Christians face when beginning their new walk with God and dealing with them in the way that God teaches us to. The unsafe person's way of dealing with conflict often follows the route of argument, antipathy, uh, animosity, and then either aversion or aggression. Well, what's all that mean? First of all, you start with an argument. It's a disagreement of some sign. Verbal, whatever, blasted somebody on Facebook, whatever. You're disagreeing. Then it moves to antipathy. It's like, well, how come you don't see it my way? Why are you disagreeing with me? Don't you know that I'm wrong and that I'm right and you're wrong? <laughs> you know? And, and so then, after argument, this hostility, and people be, get frustrated. And, and people get upset because this is, they're continuing to get pushback. And then after that comes animosity, where I really, really don't like this person. Like it can actually, depending on the person's personality, you can actually go quickly right to hatred. Like just like you get frustrated and it builds up, it's escalation, okay? Mm -hmm. So it goes from uh, argument to antipathy, which is hostility, to animosity, which resolves into hatred. And then it goes usually one of two routes, either aversion, like, get away from me, hang up the phone, I'm never talking to you again, you're off my Facebook, right? That's aversion. I'm going to avoid you. You're, 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 you're gone from my life. I don't want to talk to you anymore. Don't talk to me. Speak to the hand, right? <laughs> it goes either that way, or it becomes aggression, which is verbal aggression, yelling, screaming, throwing things, fighting, violence, domestic violence. Trust me, as a former police officer, I've seen plenty of domestic violence. And that's how the world resolves their things. It typically just escalates and escalates and escalates and ration and reason go right out the window and anger in that old flesh just takes right over. In other words, things often continue to escalate till they get out of control and cause irreparable harm. There's nothing good that can come from that. In contrast, Christ teaches us 
the way of peace and resolution to conflicts. Of course, sometimes the parts of the conflict are beyond our control. So we can only fix what we can influence. If somebody doesn't want to listen, they won't listen to reason, they don't care what I say, they don't care, you know, I'm going to call the cops. I don't care if you call the cops, I'm going to punch you in the mouth. What are you going to, they're going to punch you in the mouth. Better duck or move or hit them first or something, right? Is that right? I mean, so if, if people won't participate in the normal process of resolving uh, things, then, then it's beyond your control. Um, so sometimes parts of the conflict are beyond our control, so we have to concentrate on doing our part in the way that God prescribes and letting God deal with the rest. This is not always easy because our troubles come from both interpersonal, that's between people, and situational. Sometimes it just has to do with a place and a circumstance, a situation that you find yourself in, and sometimes it's just disagreements with other people, that's the interpersonal. So it's, it's not uncomplicated, but it's also resolvable with God. All right, second to last paragraph on the page. The common thread is that we all want our problems to stop. Can I have an amen there? Yeah. Does anybody say, oh, problems, yay, today's a problem day. <laughs> Bring it on. We all want our problems to stop yeah. and our obstacles to be removed. Yeah. I'm a big one on that. It's like, if I'm going in a direction, just get out, don't hold me back. Just get out of the way, stop slowing me down. Right? Me. <laughs> People driving in front of you, all that kind of thing. So it's just human nature. We want our problems to stop. We want our obstacles to be removed so that we can go about our life with joy and satisfaction. That's the value of learning God's path to peace and resolution. Psalm 37, 23, and 24 says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. So when we have God on our side, and we have God leading us, then it, we have someone who knows everything, does everything right all the time, who is all-powerful, and we're not just kind of stumbling through life all by ourselves trying to make something work. Yeah. Proverbs 16, verse 7, it also <coughs> says, When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. Mm -hmm. And I've seen this happen in other people's lives. I've experienced it in my own life over the years where there's people who, are, who uh, were in opposition and were contentious and things, and God just moved them out of the way. God just resolved those things, and, and we had nothing to do with it. Amen. You can never do better than walking through this life with God and following His ways. The best way to overcome is to follow the overcomer. Amen. So does anybody have any question on the introduction? It's really just setting the stage like, you know what, there, there's all kinds of new things going to be happening to you in life, and one of them is some new obstacles, but really they've always been there. You just now are better equipped to deal with them by doing it God's way. Yeah. All right, page number two, and one of the first things we'll look at tonight is conflicts with friends and family. Yeah. Matthew 18, verse 15 says this, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee. Now, notice this is specifically within a Christian context, because these are, these are rules for, all right, if you're a Christian and they're a Christian, then it should always be able to be resolved. Yeah. If you can't resolve it, it's either because you're not looking in the right place or you're trying to deal with it in your own flesh. Yeah. Difficulty, uh, uh, contentions and conflicts between Christians can always be resolved if we submit ourselves to God. Yeah. So moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But, verse 16, if you will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. So what's all that talking about? Well, this passage is talking about uh, the progression for dealing with what we called a few minutes ago interpersonal conflicts. That is, conflicts between two people or two groups, two families, if you will, whatever. Interpersonal conflicts. You begin by prayerfully seeking a resolution on a personal level. That's the first thing there in verse number 15. Go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. So you're going to him and say, listen, I have a problem with this. I, I'm, and, and it's always good, as, as Doc used to say, to come in low. 
Don't come in and all proud and say, I got a problem with you. <laughs> Go in and say, listen, I, I, I have a problem. I'm, maybe you can help me out with it. I, I really don't understand this. Like, how did this happen? And just very humbly trying to express to them, this is why this causes me a problem. Maybe they didn't even realize that they did it. If they did it intentionally, maybe they've gotten more sense by now. <laughs> And they'll be willing. So, so first step is to go to them personally, privately, and, and try in the best way that you know how, prayerfully, to resolve that. Begin by prayerfully seeking resolution on a personal level. If that doesn't work, you can take one or two others with you to arbitrate. That is to, you know, sometimes, have you ever been in a situation where you're talking to somebody, you're kind of having a disagreement, and then somebody else goes, uh, hey, can I just say something that... I think what they're saying is this, and I think what you're saying is, and you were kind of talking past each other. You're, you're familiar with that kind of a situation where you're not really listening or hearing clearly what the other person is saying. So that's the purpose of this, this one or two other people is one is to be a witness that, you know what, Daisy went to this other person and she, you know, let's say it was Jessica. She, she spiked with Jessica all the time. <laughs> not really. Um, so she has this problem with Jessica and, and you know, I was there. And Daisy was nice, and she was composed, and she, you know, she tried to explain herself, and, you know, <laughs> for those of you who have that's what I mean. <laughs> um, you know, so the idea is just for, for accountability, is to say, you know what, hey, listen, th this person, in, in good faith, they tried to get this thing settled, so it's for that, and also for them to provide maybe a a uh, mature outside perspective to try to bring the parties together. So it starts personally, and then it's one or two others. And then um, verse 17, if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. And so typically that would go through the pastor. You don't want to just say, you know, stand up during prayer request time and say, well, I have a problem with Hannah. <laughs> I tried to call her three times this week and she never called me back, right? <laughs> So you don't want to handle it that way, but the idea is that these are things that are that are fairly serious, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and rather than letting them go on and, you know, trust me, I've been in church for a long, long time. I've seen situations, fortunately, in churches bigger than this where family over here doesn't ever talk to. If they see this family coming, they go the opposite direction. It's like, what? In the, that stuff is not supposed to go on. I don't know if you know this, but that's not supposed to go on in the church. Yeah. So you go to them personally. Take somebody else with him, and if it, if it can't be resolved that way, tell it into the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen and a publican. So, if all that fails, the matter is then made public unto the church, uh, not to the public at large, to safeguard the testimony of Christianity. So, in other words, if if you feel like, listen, I need a resolution to this, then you come appropriately through the pastor and you talk about, and, and you know, the church can deal with it as a church family. You don't get on Facebook and Twitter and, and all that kind of stuff and just start blasting the other person. When I say make it public, you make it public within the family of God, if necessary, and not out in the, because the idea is you don't want to make it look like, well, why do I want to be a Christian? They're just like the rest of us. They can't even sort their own things out. So an offender who refuses to accept God's judgments on the matter then becomes as a heathen man. They don't lose their salvation. They don't become a heathen man. They become as a heathen man. In other words, they're not participating in the process. They're not acting in good faith before God and willing to accept what the Bible says in God's judgment. So then they're, just, they're acting just as a lost person would say. I have no respect for God's process. I have no respect for God's words. I have no respect for God's judgments. And, and when that happens, uh, then there's a different situation. So in other words, uh, paragraph three, we as Christians should always seek a quiet, reasonable, and rational resolution to things, guided by God's words. If you're an underliner, underline those four right there. Guided by God's words. You say, well, I don't know where to find stuff in the Bible. That's why people get the pastor involved or a more mature Christian who has a better knowledge of the Bible to say, well, here's the Bible precedent. Here's what the Bible says about this situation and how you should deal with it. <coughs> uh, bear in mind that this passage takes for granted that all parties are willing to act biblically. Why? Because it's a brother in Christ with a brother in Christ, sister in Christ with a sister in Christ. So it's taken for granted that they're willing to act biblically. 
Where that is not the case, then those who reject God's clearly stated judgments are treated no differently than if we faced a dispute with a non-believer. Romans 8, verses 7 and 8 says, The carnal mind, that is one that rejects God, I'm going to do it my way, I don't care what God says, the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. So it's not about which of us is right, but God who's right. So it's, when it gets to that situation, and somebody says, well, I don't, and I've heard had people say to me, I don't care what the Bible says, I know what I experienced, and I know what I'm going to do. Well, then, I have nothing I can offer you. If you're going to flat out reject God's word, that I have nothing more to say. Right? So it's, it's assuming that people are willing to deal, and so when they're willing to deal with things biblically, there can always be a resolution. All right, paragraph four, the biblical goal is always to seek resolution and restoration. That is, get things resolved. Every, not everybody's totally happy, but you come to an acceptable agreement. That's resolution. And beyond that, restoration. That is, you have put yourself in a place where we can now talk. Um, so the biblical goal is always resolution and restoration. So resolve things, come to a reasonable agreement. Restoration is now we can talk again, we can fellowship, we don't have to like avoid each other, eye contact and all that sort of thing. Yeah. So restoration and resolution in a most personal and private manner possible. Yeah. We never seek to sow discord or division, as the Bible calls it. So if you don't have your outline, yeah, those are so discord is in quotation marks as a division. Those are biblical terms uh, by trying to recruit people to our side. And you know something, that again is human nature. Well, did you hear what Jeff, Joanne, did you hear what Jessica said? You agree with me, don't you? She's a bad person. And Luke, don't you think Jessica's a bad person? Somebody ought to do something about her, I'll tell you what. Well, Alina, isn't she a bad person? You're never going to admit that, are you? She's on Jessica's side, 100%. But you, you get the idea. We're never, ever supposed to sow discord and division and recruit people to our side, especially if they're not directly affected or involved. Don't get people involved in disputes that they are not part of or they're not involved in. Now, the exception would be, for example, somebody you're asking counsel, you're asking that one or two other to go with you, uh, you're asking for their help in that, that sort of thing. Then... That person, they're not directly involved initially, but you're asking for them to come in as some sort of arbitrator. Um, so the Bible also warns us against such things as gossip. Gossip, not good. <clears throat> Being a busybody in other people's affairs, not good. And railing. Railing is used several times in the New Testament, and uh, it's not like a, a railing going down the stairs. It, it's, it's an action that a person does, and it's like slander. It's uh, slander... Uh, contention, harassment, it's just basically talking bad about somebody, running people down, trying to make them look bad, uh, you know, assault, uh, assault their character and all that kind of thing. So those things are, are improper, obviously, for Christians. So what should we do? Well, Romans 12, 18 says, If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. So that's, that's like a blanket goal, like... Well, I don't get along. They're not my cup of tea. I, we are con our, our personalities clash. All right, get over yourself. You just deal with it, and as much as you possibly can, you live peaceably with all men, especially those of the household of faith. 1 Peter 3, and verse number 10. For he that will love life and see good days, let him, number one, refrain his tongue from evil, and his lips that they speak no guile. Guile is like deceit, like trying to mislead somebody. So refrain your tongue from evil, lips that they don't speak guile or deceit. Let him eschew evil. Eschew means, uh, just kind of think of it in terms of like, get away from like, put, so eschew evil. Like, you know, hey, we're going to go do this and we're probably not going to get in trouble. We won't get caught even if we do, we won't get in trouble. It's like, no, 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 I don't want any part of that. That means to eschew evil. Like, get that away from me. So if you want to love life and see good days, refrain your tongue from evil, your lips from guile, eschew evil, do good, let him seek peace and ensue it. And I'm not changing the word of God, I'm just saying that the, that word is now, we would say it, pursue. And it actually means to eagerly pursue. So if you want to have favor with God, pursue peace. As much as life in you live peaceably with all men. 
always, always, always working towards a resolution. It's not going to be perfect sometimes and a perfect outcome. We don't all get to have our own way all the time, but we try to find a, a reasonable solution so we can move on. Amen. And then Ephesians 4 and verse 32, these are things we should do. Live peaceably with all men, uh, seek peace and ensue it. And then Ephesians 4, 32, be, kind, be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Amen. So the emphasis on that one, of course, is kind and tender-hearted is perfectly appropriate, but forgiving one another as Christ has forgiven us. Uh, sometimes it, it's difficult to forgive people, uh, even if they've done things just carelessly and, and callously, uh, but the idea is as Christian, we need to say, you know what, let's put it behind us. You've apologized. It's the 50th time you've apologized, but that's okay. And it really is, because Christ has said to Peter, not just seven times, but 70 times seven. Mm -hmm. And the likelihood is, unless you're one of those really by-the-book people, 70 times seven is what? 490, okay? So by the time you get to 480, you've probably lost count. <laughs> <laughs> that's really the fact so it's like unless you're keeping a book like okay you got 10 more and then that's it right so uh, we need to exercise forgiveness all right page number three first Corinthians 6 and verse 6 if brother go but brother goes to law with brother and that before unbelievers so that's talking about a, a civil court like literally taking somebody to court downtown uh, now therefore there's utterly a fault among you because you go to law one with another. Why do you not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Mm -hmm. So this one is a little bit more complex, but it's still absolutely true. And I'm going to change the words of God one bit. Um, you absolutely have the legal right to go to court as a citizen, particularly in a criminal matter. So, you know, somebody uh, comes in, trashes your car and kills your dog. It's not saying you can't take them to court or testify, I saw them do that to my property. That's not what that's talking about at all. Man. So in a criminal matter, and especially, and as a citizen of Canada, there's nothing in the Bible that says you cannot take someone to court or be in a participate in a court matter, that sort of thing. Man. Where there's some sort of civil dispute, that is not a crime, but it's a, a thing of, of a disagreement between people and parties, 1 Corinthians 6 counsels us to first explore every avenue of resolving disputes within the church. So the idea is, uh, as Christians, we try to resolve it, can I say it this way, in-house. Mm -hmm. yeah. First, yeah. you explore Matthew 18. You explore all those avenues, try to get all those disagreements. Somebody, you know, uh, agreed to do a bunch of work, you gave them a bunch of money up front, and then they ran off with the money. Like, you know, what, whatever it is. That, that's a civil matter. Uh, you know, you did a bunch of work for somebody and they, they never paid you. They agreed to pay you, but they never paid you. Before you take them to court, so I'll go to small, yes you can. As a citizen, you have every right to do that. But First Corinthians says, well, first of all, that's not helpful for the cause of Christ. No. Deal with it as a Christian first. No. Deal with it and explore every possible avenue as a Christian first of all. The idea is that frivolous lawsuits and airing our dirty laundry before non-believers is not helpful to the cause of Christ. Does that make sense? Do I need to explain that? If, you know, if you just found out, you know, here it is flashed on the front page of the Times and Transcript. Joanne and I are fighting it out in court. You know, pastor sues parishioner, you know, <laughs> <laughs> for laughing in the back row. You know, I mean, that's, that's the kind of thing. But, hey, those things have gone on. And Paul is writing here under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost and say, hey, this stuff shouldn't be happening. If we got problems that are not of a criminal nature, we should be taking care of this within the church and not airing it out before the unbelievers. No. Uh, if it's not a criminal matter, it's better to, <clears throat> that we take the loss and chalk it up to experience than to essentially declare that there's no benefit to becoming a Christian. Christian. So that's what he's saying there at the end of verse 7. Is why do you not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? You say, well, that's not fair. I have a judgment due. I, I'm... Yes, def suffer yourself to be defrauded means you got shafted. You got the wrong end of the stick. Uh, you were mistreated. You, you didn't get what you deserve. But Paul said it's better to do that 
than to you know air this stuff out and and hinder the cause of Christ. The book of Proverbs and many other places in the Bible counsels us uh, how to avoid putting ourselves in the position to be exploited in the first place. So you know oftentimes. And I've done this myself, and not too long ago, where I have done things for people that I know and, and people uh, who are friends and things. And I find this, whenever I have done work for people and tried to cut them a break, I usually end up losing my shirt. <laughs> and, and not necessarily intentionally, but because I'm trying to help them out, and they have no idea that if you were paying somebody else to do this, it'd be like three times this. And I'm trying to do you a favor, and, then, and their continual question is, why does this cost so much? Well, go to the store and figure it out. So it, it, it seems like the more that you try to give people a break sometimes, so the idea is as a contractor, for example, I should have a contract. This is what I'm going to do. This is the materials. This is the type of finish. This is all the details. Is that what you want? Yes. It's going to cost you this much. If I don't estimate it pro properly, that's on me. That's my problem. If I say it's going to cost $5,000 and it costs $6,000, I have to eat that. Unless they say, oh, I realize it costs more, right? Yeah. But on the other hand, you know, if you don't have any contract and say, oh, we'll, we'll just do it, we'll work it out, and then all of a sudden, now you don't want to pay me, well, whose fault is that? It's my fault, because I allowed myself to get into that position. So here's what the Bible says, for example, Proverbs twenty two twenty six says this, be not one of them that strike hands or of them that are sureties for debts. If thou hast nothing to pay, why should he take away thy bed from under thee? So that's agreeing to take responsibility for somebody else's actions or somebody else's debts and things like that. But I said, don't do that. If it's not your debt to pay, and you can't really afford to pay it if you have to, it's, you might as well go to the casino and roll the dice. Yeah. Because maybe they'll work and say, oh, I trust them, they're good for it. Well, what if they're not? Then how are you going to pay for it? So the Bible says, if you don't have it to pay, if you don't have the wherewithal, in other words, if you can't suffer the loss, then don't take the chance. So if you say, well, I'm, I'm going to give uh, Luke 20 bucks. I, I trust him to pay me. You know what? If Luke doesn't pay me back the 20 bucks, I probably won't even mention it to him. I'll just say, well, you know, he needed the 20 bucks. Maybe he forgot about it. And Lord, if I need the 20 bucks, help him to remember. You don't owe me 20 bucks, by the way. <laughs> well, maybe you do. <laughs> no, just kidding. You understand what I'm saying? But if Luke says, hey, can I borrow a thousand bucks? Like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> What's it for? How are you going to pay it back? When's it going to be paid back? And, and if you can't suffer the loss of it, don't do it. Yeah. And, and so the, the, you say, well, it's not fair. Why should I suffer myself to be defrauded? Well, if it's your fault that you got there and, and exposed yourself to that in the first place, then just take the loss and don't bring shame upon Christ. Yeah. Yeah. All right? So there are many things that can cause disagreements and a falling out between individuals, even Christians. The important thing is when disputes arise is that we handle them in a godly way. No. You get that? When disputes arise, in a family, between families, people, whatever, handle it in a godly way no. that does not bring shame on the cause of Christ. Often we will find that some misunderstanding is at the root of many conflicts. And when we slow down and explore it calmly and rationally, we can work our way through it without damage. And I, man, I've seen that happen. I have been involved in helping people to see what's really going on. I've had it happen myself where you just, you know how it is, you, you feel like mistreated. You feel disrespected. And your emotion just goes, mm, mm, and they go, because mm, you're, mm, mm. and pretty soon everybody in the room is going, mm, 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 mm. right? But when you slow down and talk it through, say, Oh, you mean you didn't? No, I didn't mean that. Oh, oh, sorry about that. Right? <laughs> All right, so when we talk it through, you can come through without damage. All right, uh, second last paragraph. There's an old saying that says, because that's what sayings do, they say stuff. Uh, there's an old saying that says, you can be right or you can be happy. Comedians have used that in different ways and that sort of thing, but the idea is, you know, some people, it's just like, once you say something, you got to stick with it, and, and nobody's ever going to prove You can be right, or you can be happy. You just go through trying to fight your way into being right all the time. Many times we have conflicts simply because we don't want to admit that we're wrong. Or we may have expressed ourselves poorly. 
We need to remember the warning from 1 Peter 5 and verse 5. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. So whenever, what's the Bible saying verse, in the book of Proverbs? Only by pride cometh contention. Well, when, when contention goes out, then, then the, or when the pride goes out, then contention ceases. Of course, it's clear, uh, a clear matter of Christian principle that we are right to stand our ground. So it doesn't mean that you just let everybody steamroller over you and everything. The thing to remember here, though, is that the authority for Christian principle is the words of God. Not how we feel, not what we think what everyone else is doing, nor the traditions of culture and culture of mankind. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you say, well, I'm going to stand on principle. Well, is it really principle or is it your opinion? Mm -hmm. Is it how you feel? Is it your thought? If it's a Christian principle and you can back it up from the Bible, by all means, stand firm on it. Yeah. But other than that, be very careful about invoking Christian principle. The supremacy of God and his words is so emphatic that Romans 3 and verse 4 actually says, Yea, let God be true and every man a liar. You say, well, they're wrong. Well, there's enough wrong to go around. And we all share in that. Mm -hmm. If we can't make our, our case clear by, uh, by, sorry, if we can't make our case by a clear reading of God's words, then it's just opinion, whether it's ours or someone else's. Mm -hmm. All right, page four. After interpersonal conflicts comes another <coughs> great obstacle to many Christians, which is competing obligations. So personal conflicts and then competing obligations. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 3 says, Thou therefore endure hardness. Sometimes things just get hard. Sometimes things are just uncomfortable and they're an uphill climb. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Now, the next little paragraph I put in there, and you can use those verses if you need to. You guys have heard that verse enough. You know what it's talking about. It's not talking about go to war literally like shooting bows and arrows at your neighbor, throwing rocks at him and that sort of thing. It's talking about speaking metaphorically of a spiritual battle and not a physical one of force and violence, and those scriptures will deal with that. So for someone who's newly saved, they may not get that. You know, that I need to be like a soldier of Jesus Christ and I need to go to war with people? No, that's not what it's meaning. It's no. meaning in our spiritual battle that we have to uh, be careful of competing obligations, that we don't get entangled, verse number four, with the affairs of this life. So the idea here is that being of service to Jesus Christ becomes your highest priority. First, or Colossians, rather, 1 and verse 10 outlines the obligation towards God that we have as Christians. That you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. That's what is supposed to be happening once we get saved. Yeah. That we grow and we increase in the knowledge of the Lord and we become fruitful in every good work. And we're, we're trying to do things that are pleasing to the Lord. So if you look at uh, the Colossians chapter 1 and verses 10 through 18, and that's what this part of the thing is talking about without writing all the scripture out, the following verses give numerous justifications for this expectation. The expectation that we should be pleasing to God, that we should be giving Him first priority. Well, why should we do that? Well, it says things like this in that passage, because we are strengthened with all might according to His glorious power. He's the one that gives us the power to get through this life. Yeah. Because he has made us worthy of experiencing heaven, verse number 12. Because he delivered us from the power of darkness. Yeah. Because we have redemption through his blood and the forgiveness of sins. Yeah. Because Jesus is the only visible expression of an invisible God, verse 15. Mm -hmm. Because all things were created by him and for him. So what right does God have to demand it? Well, wait a minute. He made you. That gives him the right. He saved you. That gives him the right. He empowers you to get through life. That gives him the right. Jesus Christ is the only thing we've ever seen of God in physical flesh. That gives him the right. Uh, yeah. And that all things were created by him and for him, verse 16, and because he is before all things, and by him all things consist. So he came before us. He made us. He has every right to demand that we put him first. He's God. All right? 
Then if you look at verse number 18, the passage concludes by saying, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. That's a very clear statement. Not in some things or in these specific things. <coughs> in all things, Christ is to have the preeminence. Yeah. So how do we interpret that? When it comes right down to it, nothing should take priority over Jesus Christ. If the choice must be made to discard one thing or another, and you can't choose both. In other words, if the only resolution is, I can't be in two places at once, I can't do two things at once, or I can't choose this and choose Christ, you always choose Christ. No. As a Christian, he, is the, he has the preeminence, he, ha, he is the default choice. If it comes down to making a choice and I can't do both things, and I have to pick one or the other, it's always Jesus Christ, no. if you're following the Lord. Um, Second to last paragraph, the, the Apostle Paul even said in Acts 20, 24, But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. So here's a, a few tips to keep from getting into the place where we feel conflicted so that we have to choose. So a lot of times, because remember I talked about before when I talked about the things uh, that kind of get hitting you from all sides and it just becomes overwhelming? Yeah. Well, sometimes we can get... So like, oh, every time I turn around, I'm going to have to make a choice between my life and, and Christ, my life and Christ. How do we avoid that? Number one, streamline your life as much as possible so that you're not maxed out and never have any time or resources to offer God. So a lot of people, they just live life. I mean, I, I'm pretty ambitious. I, I like to live life and stay busy. Um, but you, you can get so busy that you have no time for God. Like there's no... There's no wiggle room. There's no, there's no nothing. There's not a place for you to lay down, for you to stop and take a rest, to go on vacation. There's no place for God. Like you just got everything so tightly scheduled and go, 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 go. It's like if God says, hey, I have need of you, wh where do you fit him in? Mm -hmm. Even if God says, well, you can, you, you, can, you can do it on your own time schedule, but I need you for an hour. I don't have an hour, God. I don't have an hour in my schedule. I <clears throat> that shouldn't be happening. If you're too busy for God, you're too busy. Amen. 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 So, first of all, streamline your life as much as possible. That is, cut things down, simplify things so that you're not maxed out and you never have time or resources to offer God. Number two, trust Christ. And, and Hebrews 12, 1 talks about that, laying aside the, the weights and that sort of thing in our life. Uh, trust Christ, number two, to take care of your needs when he needs you to be of service to him. So Matthew chapter 6, verses 32 and 33, your <coughs> heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of things. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness first, and all these things will be added unto you. I've said it to you before this way, you take care of God's business, he will take care of your business. Amen. So sometimes we go like, well, but if I do this, I'm not going to be able to do that. Well, do, God, do God's thing first, and he will make the other stuff happen that needs to happen. And uh, You'll find that also in Ephesians 3. 20 and 21, and you can look those up on your own or, or with somebody if you're going through this lesson. So simplify your life so that you're not maxed out. Trust Christ to take care of your needs when he needs you to be of, of service to him. So if God calls, you just pick up the phone and answer, and you drop everything else and go. Yeah. That's it. That, it's as simple as I can say. You just you give God first place. Number three, don't be trapped in relationships and obligations that will conflict with serving Christ. So 2 Corinthians 6.14 talks about don't be unequally yoked together. That principle of an unequal yoke, it describes two things pulling, in, pulling you in opposite directions. So the danger is obviously that you might choose against Christ. So whatever it is, yoke, yoke means you're, you're hooked into something. You're, you're obligated. You're connected. You have to be there. Well, what if you have to be a service to Christ and you have to be there? Now you're yoked to something else, and, and you're basically you're saying, God, I'm, I'm off limits, I'm off the clock, I'm not available to you. Mm -hmm. We're not supposed to be unequally yoked and put ourselves into a place where there's, we, we, can, we can foreseeably know that there's going to be a conflict. Because what happens is at first we make an exception, and we make a little diversion, and we say, well, it's just this one time. Well, it's just this one thing. Well, it's just, you know, it's just when the, the uh, family comes over. Well, it's just this, it's just that. 
and pretty soon it's just always the other thing and not God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And after a while, it just becomes like there's not even a contest. Mm -hmm. If this thing is in conflict with God, this thing wins every time. Mm -hmm. And God just has to take a second, uh, second seat. And that is not what God expects of a Christian. Mm -hmm. So just some things about uh, competing obligations. Those are obstacles for a Christian. They'll keep you from growing. They'll keep you from having the blessing of God. Because God can't bless disobedience. So we need to try to distance ourselves from competing obligations. Always give ourselves the opportunity to be of use to God at any given time when he might need us. And to make sure that we're resolving conflicts in a godly way as he's told us to do.